I'm Dan Flickinger. I'm a senior researcher at Stanford University, and I want to talk to you uh, today about the work that we have been doing with the Redbird Language Arts and Writing Program. Um, this is a software program that has deep roots in research that's been going on at Stanford for, in fact, a quite long time. Um, and I want to walk you through the, some of the work that we've done so far and where we're um, headed in the near term with the research we're doing in collaboration with McGraw-Hill. Let me first start with a, a question, uh, a couple of questions for you about the state of play right now in uh, the work that students are doing in writing in elementary and high school. I'll ask you a few questions. I will not wait for you to give those replies because of the nature of this webinar, um, but I uh, will give you a chance to think those through. So what, per, what ratio of students uh, at eighth and 12th grade uh, lack proficiency in writing? You could ask yourself. Well. Sadly, that's three out of every four students. That is, only a quarter of our students are coming out at these grade levels with proficiency in writing uh, on standard measures. Second question, uh, out of 12th graders, uh, what proportion of students fall below even the most basic level of writing? Uh, that, uh, there's a, a, a clue in the answer if your grammar is good. Um, you can see it's singular, so there's one out of those five students still. That's a 20% of the students that finish high school are not yet ready to do even the most basic writing, a skill we need in society. The third question, um, the average fourth grader spends how many hours a week, a week writing? Uh, that's a, a, a surprising number for us uh, and a little bit distressing. Fewer than three hours are spent writing each week. There is a pretty good reason for that. Uh, uh, in terms of practicality, our teachers are working with large classrooms of students quite often, and the students um, might not mind writing, but they write best when they get feedback, when they get responses on the kind of writing they're doing, where they're doing well, where they're having trouble. And a teacher with a large classroom is going to find it burdensome, to say the least, uh, to be able to uh, write uh, uh, remarks, comments, suggestions, uh, critique of what each student is writing to give that personalized response, which is what the students need in order to be able to make forward progress. And so teachers, uh, understandably but sadly, choose not to make very many writing assignments because of that burden on uh, being able to make the corrections. So the software that we've been working on is an attempt to d divide that labor in a productive way, to let the machine, to let the computer do some of the work of interacting with the student on their writing. Primarily, as you will see, in, in improving um, skills in terms of mechanics, uh, punctuation, spelling, grammar, um, a little bit to do with the meaning of sentences and, and paragraphs. Uh, and that leaves the teacher free to make the kinds of comments on student writing that a machine is not well prepared to do about truthfulness, about entertainment, about clarity. Uh, and that division of labor, we think, is a more effective way of giving students an opportunity to write and uh, allowing the teacher to not go crazy with the effort required in order to make that, um, uh, give that feedback that the student needs. The research we have been doing at Stanford goes back a number of years. In fact, uh, the work that uh, Patrick Supis, the gentleman you see there on the left, he has been uh, working at Stanford, had been working at Stanford for more than 50 years, working on using computers in education. He began that work in the field of mathematics, working with very young students, elementary school students, and providing ever more sophisticated software programs that allowed them to interactively develop their mathematics skills. About 25 years ago, he began to expand that work into the area of language arts and writing which is important, but more challenging for a computer in some ways because the range of correct and incorrect answers varies a lot. It's difficult in writing tasks to say for a computer that answer was exactly right or exactly wrong. About 10 years ago, he brought my, uh, me and my colleagues into work on that uh, task using a relatively sophisticated grammar of English that we have been building at Stanford for uh, not quite that long, but for about 25 years adding that technology to this program for language arts and writing to evaluate the grammaticality of the sentences that students are writing, to focus on that mechanics and allow the machine to do judgment about which errors occurred and provide personalized responses to the student as they're writing. 
Let me show you a few examples of that. In the Language Arts and Writing course, we offer short videos uh, and uh, other um, audiovisual support that give the students reminders about key points of grammar, mechanics, style um, that they need to know in improving their writing. Uh, some of these are exciting and some are simply necessary medicine for the student to remind them of things that they have perhaps already learned in the classroom but need to be uh, need, need to have some reinforcement for. So you'll see on the screen there a slide that's a snapshot from one of the videos about um, teaching the way in which pronouns are used in English. That video will play for a couple of minutes and then we give the students opportunities to demonstrate that they understand or have learned that information and uh, they do a few exercises. Some of them are multiple choice, some fill in the blank. The most interesting of these exercises from my point of view are the composition exercises, where we ask the student to actually write a sentence uh, in response to some kind of a prompt. Some of those prompts are that we tell them a very short story and ask them to respond with the content from the story using a vocabulary list. In uh, other instances, like the one you see on the screen here, we give the student a chart or a graph, some visual content, ask them to look at that graph for a bit, uh, evaluate its content, and then use the word list that you see in the lower right of that screen uh, in order to construct a sample answer. Now, in this case, the student doesn't quite get the answer correct. They're given a, uh, a response from the machine, which we have constructed in real time. We took their sentence fed it through the system that we have built, this grammar and parser for English. We identified a mistake and give them an indication in that red box toward the bottom of the screen that says, why don't you try again? You made one small mistake. You're just about right. See if you can change your answer and produce a well-formed a grammatical sentence. Here's another example where we ask the student to respond to um, a, a prompt um, about uh, writing the first sentence of a paragraph. And the student has an image in mind about some great historical event, probably one where the student did well, and the, the writer says, I want an awesome game. Content-wise, that's clear. It's even a pretty okay start to a, a short paragraph about their experience, but they have missed uh, one of the critical words in a well-formed English sentence, namely the article that comes in front of count nouns. And so we give them not too much instruction, but we give them a little bit of a reminder about the principle that, is, um, that underlies the mistake they made and ask them to make a correction. We have uh, a wide variety of relatively frequently occurring errors uh, that we are prepared to respond to the student with. Uh, and that's drawn from the last 10 years of experience in using this technology with students in the classroom. We've in fact collected somewhere upwards of 10 million answers that students have made to the thousand or so sentence composition exercises that are included in the language arts and writing course uh, for McGraw-Hill. Um, and that, that is a data source that continues to grow and we continue to study that. So we are looking always for more opportunities to discover the kinds of errors that students make and give more informative responses to those. Here's a, just a quick sample. We have about 220 error types that we now uh, identify. This is just a sampling of those, and you'll see that they range from the very general, uh, our, our most basic response when the machine despairs of making any sense of what the student wrote, they just say, sorry, your answer isn't grammatical, you're gonna have to try again. Or that it's not a complete sentence, uh, or that uh, it needs a preposition, they're missing a word, they've added a word. You'll see toward the bottom, there's a remark about that famous um, it's, it's alternation where a student reasonably but wrongly decides to put in an apostrophe when it's is used as a possessive, as in um, its tail was wagging, uh, and or they neglect to put in the apostrophe when it's a contraction. We have a variety of uh, errors that are made mostly by native English writers. Um, we are also building a library of error types that are made by people who speak another language as their native language and are learning English. Uh, as young students, they learn very quickly. That's fortunate. But there are still certain error types that only happen because they come with uh, a influence from a different language. And so that's one of the areas of research and development that we're doing now to expand this inventory of error types that are frequent in student writing in the United States um, and looking to expand those uh, error types with 
students also in this country who come with other reasons for making mistakes, and we'd like to be responsive to those. We have studied this technology now in the classroom. As I indicated, it's been in use for about 10 years. We did a study, a careful study in a school district, uh, in fact, the entire city of Memphis, Tennessee, a few years ago. And we did that study over a period of about two years. So we started with the students' performance on the state exam at the beginning, at the end of the year before we started. So in the spring of uh, one of those years. And then in the fall, we asked the students to start using our software. Uh, we measured how much they used it, and we measured their progress, their, their rate of success within our program. Uh, that's a study or measure we have quite good control over. And then at the end of the year, we had them take the uh, state exam again. They didn't have much choice. That's the way state exams work. And we compared that end of year score against the score they made the year before and correlated that with the amount of work they did in our program. So students who didn't use our course at all, uh, there's no real effect. They just did what they did. And sadly, in Memphis during those years, the tendency was for students to drop slightly below grade level year by year. So they were making um, not quite enough progress on average to stay at grade level. On the other hand, uh, those students who used our program quite a bit uh, showed some very satisfying progress in terms of improved scores. They actually went up and went up in some cases quite significantly from one year to the next. That uh, rather mysterious chart you see on the screen has red boxes and green boxes. The green boxes show you in one corner the, the number of points on about a 600 point scale that the students increased over the year. And the other number in the other corner shows you uh, how, how many of the students in our sample size um, were reflected in that box. So you'll see that it's down toward the middle that you get the numbers in thousands. We had about 5,000 students who did this study, were in the study with us over a period of two years. And at the end of the two years, we had a substantial number of students who had scored 5, 10, 15, 20 points better. They had broken the normal trend in that district, which was to drop score year by year, and in fact were making significant headway. The most interesting result of, of that study from our point of view was that those students who had been the farthest behind, who were showing the least mastery, the least proficiency in language arts and writing, were the ones who gained the most benefit from this program. Not surprisingly, students who used the software a lot made the most benefit, at least not surprising for us. We're confident and have it shown in this efficacy study that the software is good medicine for the students. This ability to practice writing, to get the machine either confirm that the correction was made successfully, to be or that there's more. Those factors combine very well to give the students the tools they need to bring themselves up to a better level of mastery, a better level of proficiency. One of the key elements of this software that uh, Patrick Soupies and his team built starting 50 years ago and that has been refined and is now in the coursework that we provide is this notion of adaptive motion. The, the concept here is the student does a certain number of exercises on a particular point, something let's say about uh, how to use pronouns in coordination. So a student starts out writing, me and my friends went to the store yesterday. Well, that's probably what they say out loud and I think we'll probably do little to fix that, but we can help them to correct their writing so that they use more conventional standard English when they're writing for us and for their teacher so that they will change that to my friends and I went to the store. That focus on pronouns is not something that's easy to learn for students and we give them some instruction and then ask them to practice some exercises. What you see there on the screen is a sketch of this motion that says we are attending to not only whether the student gets a particular exercise answered correctly or not, but what that pattern of behavior is over a small window of time. If the student gets one right, one wrong, one right, one wrong, it's pretty likely they're just guessing. They may be guessing quite well, they may be beating the odds slightly, but they haven't convinced us they really understand this concept. On the right hand side, you see a different pattern. The student starts to do the exercise and says, I just don't understand this. I don't quite get why it's working, I'll keep trying. And over a, the course of a few exercises, catches on something clicks in the brain and the student says, oh yeah, that's right, that's how you have to do that when you write, even if that's not what I think is normal sounding. 
they, get, they gain mastery of this particular concept and they start making correct answer after correct answer. The motion engine, which is built into the deep end of the software that we use for language arts and writing, it's also used in the mathematics course, uh, attends to that behavior and at the level of the exercise by exercise movement, um, decides whether the student has mastered this concept well enough to be able to move forward, to move ahead to the next one. There are other layers, other levels at which that same monitoring of the student's performance over time and attending to the pattern and behavior, not just to individual responses, it, that's, that's woven into the software and allows us to use this adaptive motion both in choosing which next exercise to present within a particular lesson, but also which lesson to pr produce next, which, which concept uh, to give the student in order to um, help them to move forward. In summary then, we have a, a range of technologies in use here. As you know, because that's my passion as the linguist working in this project, on this work, we have a relatively sophisticated grammar of English, which allows us to judge student uh, answers, both individual sentences and, and sentences within a paragraph, within a short essay. We can judge the correctness of those against standard English uh, we've incorporated into that grammar a set of errors, a rich set of errors of the kind students typically make, and we can spot those errors with high confidence in student writing and give responses to those. So we have a core linguistic, computational linguistics technology that's built into the software. We have this sophisticated adaptive motion engine built in, which is uh, figuring out uh, what to do next in cooperation with the student based on the behavior on the performance of the student in the moment, we decide what the most uh, uh, useful step would be in moving forward, whether to rehearse some previous material, go on to new material, stay, with, stay in the moment and do some more practice. Those are both all possibilities that are incorporated in the adapt adaptive engine. We also have this very specific instructional response that we give to a student. So when we found an error, we tell them exactly what the error was, we give them a brief reminder about what the principle underneath was, uh, and we give them an opportunity to make that correction. And then we check to see whether the correction was made successfully and move the student forward. The, that combination of technologies and this rich instructional material, including the short lectures, reminders, the ability to go back to supplemental material, opportunities to engage in games that reinforce certain practices, certain, certain proficiencies. Um, we incorporate uh, writing reviews, which allow the student to take these individual skills uh, and demonstrate how far they're going, how far they've come by writing uh, short essays in a rather carefully scaffolded structure. So we're giving the student the, the concept by concept specific instruction, and we're also giving them the opportunity to demonstrate that they're getting the hang of it, of this. They're, they understand uh, how writing works uh, and they get a chance to spread their wings and fly. So thank you for learning, uh, listening to this discussion. Um, we invite you to look at the redbirdlearning.com website for more information. There are uh, demonstrators on that site, um, uh, sample exercises, sample lectures, uh, some of these are interactive, so you can actually test the response behavior of the system, of this engine for language arts and writing, and see what kinds of responses uh, the machine will give to the student for errors of various kinds. And we look forward to hearing from you uh, in your reactions to this software.